This is a case that happened in England. The killer was executed seven months after the crime, becoming one of the last eight people to be hanged in Britain before the abolition of capital punishment. But for more than 40 years, this case has been controversial. The reason is that there were two main suspects in the incident. One suspect denied the crime adamantly when he was convicted and said to his family before his execution, I'm leaving this world tomorrow, but I'm innocent. Please help me clear my name. The other suspect, who was not convicted, insisted that he was the killer for the rest of his days. This is the story of the Bedford incident. Michael Gregston, 36, was a scientist who worked at a research laboratory near SLU. Michael was married and had two boys with his wife Janet Grayston, Simon, 8, and Anthony, almost 2. But Michael had an affair with his 22-year-old laboratory assistant, Valerie Story. Their relationship began with their common love for car rallies, music, and drama. On the night of August 22, 1961, around 9 p.m., Michael Gregston and his lover Valerie Story drove a Morris Minor 1000 car to a cornfield near Buckinghamshire for a date. During their date, a stranger tapped lightly on the car window. Gregston thought he was asking for direction and rolled down the window. To his surprise, the man pointed a revolver at them and said in a low voice, I've been in prison four times. I'm on the run now. I have no choice but to do this. Listen to me and you'll be fine. The man spoke with a noticeable London accent. In many people's minds, London accent seems to be equivalent to standard British English. But in fact, London accent refers to the East London accent, where most residents have low incomes. Its main feature is that when TH appears in words, it is often pronounced as F. Valerie tried to get Michael to drive away, but Michael was afraid that they could not leave safely without getting hurt. The man took the keys from Michael and sat in the back seat. He wore a mask made of gloves on his face. Since it was night and the back seat was dark, they could not see his appearance clearly. After getting in the car, the man pointed the gun at them and said nothing, as if he was thinking about what to do next. He never expressed his intention. After more than an hour, he told Michael to drive because he was hungry. They went to a milk bar and refueled at a gas station. They drove past London Heathrow Airport, through the Middlesex suburbs, onto the A5 road, and then onto the A6 road. After driving for a while, they arrived at Bedfordshire. During the journey of about 60 miles, Michael and Valerie also tried to escape, but they did not dare to act rashly. Valerie also stuffed pound notes into her underwear to prevent them from being taken away. Around 1.30 a.m. on August 23rd, the stranger asked Michael to stop near Deadman Hill. He said he needed a tip and he was tired and needed a rest. He repeated each sentence two or three times. He also asked Michael for his wallet, but when Michael reached for his wallet, the stranger shot him twice in the head. Valerie saw the scene and shouted, You killed him! You bastard! Why did you do that? His answer was he moved too fast and scared me. Be quiet, I'm thinking. He repeated this sentence several times. Valerie was impressed by this. At this point, only Valerie and the killer were left in the car. Valerie tried to establish a friendly relationship with the killer who killed Michael in order to save her life. His tone also changed. Then the killer raped Valerie on the back seat of the car. After that, he ordered Valerie to drag Michael's body from the car to the roadside. During this time, some passing vehicles briefly illuminated the killer's face with their headlights, but only the upper half could be seen. When the killer tried to drive away, he asked Valerie how to operate the vehicle and identify the instrument panel of the car. It seemed that he was not very familiar with cars. Valerie also gave him all her cash on her body hoping not to hurt him, but he still turned around and shot her four times, then reloaded and shot three more times five bullets hit Valerie one hit her neck and damaged her spine another four hit her left shoulder the killer thought Valerie was dead and drove south towards Luton. Valerie lay on the roadside for more than four hours until 6.45 a.m. when a farm worker Sidney Burton found her and notified John Cole, a nearby Oxford University student who was doing road survey. John came to Valerie's side and found that she was not only alive but also able to speak. John asked her if she was okay. Valerie said not very well. I was shot. Valerie asked John to tell her parents she was afraid they would worry that she didn't come home. John called the police and an ambulance during this time. John also asked Valerie some questions. Valerie described the killer as not tall with light hair and dark eyes John wrote these down on a note and gave it to a man wearing a duckle cap who claimed to be a policeman at the scene but this note never appeared later and did not become evidence of the case. Valerie was transferred to the intensive care unit. Her clothes were stained with blood and were handed over to the police as evidence. After treatment, Valerie survived but due to spinal damage, she was completely paralyzed below the waist and would never be able to leave the wheelchair for life. Strangely, after she woke up, her description of the killer changed to dark hair and bright eyes. 
Michael Braxton's mother also went to the crime scene to identify her son's body. Although Michael's face was unrecognizable, she confirmed that it was him. Later that day, two witnesses, John Skillett and Edward Blackhall, claimed that they saw the killer driving the Morris Minor car used for escape. They said the car was very unstable and almost hit their car at a traffic light and stopped next to their car. They also rolled down the window and scolded the other party. They saw that the driver was a young man and roughly described his appearance. The police made a portrait based on the descriptions of the two witnesses and Valerie. The portrait was released to the public through the media on August 30th. Soon the case attracted widespread attention. That night, the car involved in the case was found behind Redbridge subway station in London. But the car had obviously been cleaned up and the police did not find any more clues on the car. On August 24th, the police made a new discovery on a public bus in a garage in Peckham, London. Under the seat at the back of the bus, there was a revolver wrapped in a handkerchief. This bus had been serving Route 36A from Peckham to Paddington. Through ballistic comparison, the police confirmed that this was the murder weapon used by the killer. That is to say, within 48 hours of the crime, the police found both the car and the weapon involved in the case. Scotland Yard Chief Inspector Robert Arkett was in charge of investigating this case. He appealed through major newspapers and asked hotel owners, boarding houses, and other service providers who provide accommodation and catering in and around London whether they had seen any suspicious people recently. Soon after, a man who claimed to be the owner of Alexander Court Hotel said that there was a man who matched the description living in his hotel and locked himself in his room for five days after the crime, which was very suspicious. The police soon found this man. He called himself Frederick Durant, but the police soon found out that this was a fake name. His real name was Peter Lewis Alphen, a vagrant who lived on inheritance and gambling. He was the son of a senior official of Scotland Yard. Alphen admitted that he did stay in his room for a few days, but he had nothing to do with the murder case. On August 22nd, he did not stay at Alexander Court Hotel, but stayed with his mother. The next day, he stayed at another Vienna hotel. Later, William Nunn's manager of Vienna Hotel confirmed that Alphen did stay at Vienna Hotel, and this Vienna Hotel hotel is located on Route 36A bus where murder weapon was found. On September 11, William Nudds, manager of Vienna Hotel found two bullet casings in a basement room. After ballistic testing, police confirmed that casings matched murder weapon. At this point, Nudds who had previously insisted that Alphen stayed in room 6 all night changed his statement. He realized that Alphen might have swapped rooms with someone else at night. The person who stayed in room 6 on the May 23rd not have been Alphen. It is possible that Alphen was staying in the basement. So police asked Alphen to participate in an identity parade with Valerie, but Valerie did not identify Alphen he passed by Alphen at close range, but identified an unrelated pilot, so Alphen was released. At this point, police noticed another suspect, who was tenant living in basement room mentioned by Nuds. Nuds said last tenant of basement room named James Ryan. This man had asked about information of 36A bus stop after investigation by police. James Ryan was not real named. His real name was James Hanrity. James Hanrity was born on October 4, 1936. He was eldest of four brothers. His father, Jimmy Hanrity, served in army and was away from home for a long time. In 1944, when London was bombed, James was one of 800,000 and children evacuated from British towns James and his brother Michael were evacuated to Barrow Inferness in Cumbria his childhood life was hard he was described as a psychotic and pathological liar since he was young in 1951 when James was 15 years old he left school as an illiterate he worked as a cleaner a forklift driver and other jobs in 1954 James was attracted by Soho he frequented various clubs from September 1954 to March 1961, he was sentenced to prison four times for mostly theft, vehicle theft, and dangerous driving. Soon James became a prime suspect. On October 11, 1961, James was arrested by the police at the Stony Stratford Cafe. During the interrogation, James denied the charges. He said he had an alibi that he was not at the crime scene. He was with three friends in Liverpool on the day of the incident, but he would not reveal their names. Three days later, the police conducted another identity parade for Valerie and asked the killer to repeat the phrase quiet, I'm thinking, because this was Valerie's most impressive impression of the killer. James had a noticeable London accent like the killer, so he pronounced I'm thinking as I'm thinking. Valerie identified James as the killer. Therefore, James was charged with murder. The trial began on January 22, 1962 at Bedford Court. It was presided over by Justice Gorman and a jury. The trial of James Hannity lasted for 21 days, which was the longest trial in British legal history at that time. James was tried for murdering Michael Gregston. According to British law at that time, a person was prosecuted for the most serious crime, so he was not tried for assaulting and attempting to murder Valerie Story. During the trial, Valerie was an important witness for the prosecution. The prosecution
prosecution team included Jeffrey Lane, who later became the Lord Chief Justice. James's defense lawyer was Michael Sherrod. The defense initially seemed more favorable. Although James had been imprisoned several times and was a habitual thief, he had never been convicted of violence. According to Valerie's description, the killer was a bad driver, while James was an experienced car thief who had been jailed for dangerous driving. He had excellent driving skill. During the trial, James said he had an alibi that he and his friends were in Liverpool on the day of the incident. There he visited a criminal friend and a former prison mate from Dingle, Terry McNally, to sell some jewelry. James said he handed over a suitcase to a man with a deformed hand at Lime Street Station. In court, the prosecution summoned Peter Stringer, who had an artificial limb, but Peter denied ever seeing the suitcase or James. The prosecution also presented evidence that James was still in London on August 21st. On August 21st, James had asked for directions to Tarleton Road at a candy store on Scotland Road. Ding Woody, who worked at the candy store, recalled that there was indeed someone like James who asked for directions and was sure that it happened on Monday, August 21st. But the defense argued that Ding Woody had mistaken the date. On the third day of the trial, James admitted to his defense lawyer that he had made a part of his alibi in Liverpool because he was not sure if he could prove where he was. Then he said that he actually went to Rill, a coastal town in Wales. So the defense prepared a new alibi for James. It was alleged that James arrived in Rill on Tuesday night, August 22nd, and sold a stolen watch to a local bootlegger. That night he stayed at a hotel near the railway line and remembered locking up the attic room. He described the exact layout of the hotel and even remembered that there was a green bathtub in the bathroom. The private detective found Grace Jones who was the landlady of the hotel. As James described it, there was indeed a green bathtub in the attic room. The hotel floor plan described by James also matched exactly with reality. Jones told the police that there was indeed a man who looked like James who stayed in the attic room for about a week from August 19th to 26th. The police's response was to find out all the tenants who stayed at this hotel that night and prove that all rooms were occupied and James could not have stayed there. Later Valerie appeared as the most important witness for the prosecution and gave a detailed description of what happened in this case and identified James as the killer face to face. Valerie appeared in court in a wheelchair and the jury sympathized with everything she said. But the defense pointed out that Valerie had identified someone else in her first identity parade and she only saw the killer briefly under very bad conditions. The defense lawyer also doubted whether Valerie could accurately identify him based on this. The defense lawyer also pointed out that apart from James's blood type being O-type, like the killer's blood type O-type, is also very common among people of about 40% of the population have it. Even in the UK, this is a common blood type for about 20 million people, and it cannot be used as evidence. In addition, there was no evidence to link James to the crime scene. He did not know the two victims, and had no reasonable motive to kidnap them. That is to say, all the accusations came from Valerie's face-to-face -face identification. At 11.22 a.m. on February 7, 1962, the jury began to discuss their verdict. They looked through the testimonies of the witnesses and the 136 pieces of evidence in this case. At 9.10 p.m., James looked anxiously at the jury returning to the court. The jury took nearly 10 hours to make a decision. They announced that James Hannity was guilty. The judge then made the final verdict and sentenced James Hannity to death. The defense immediately appealed. James walked down from the court with a pale face. He saw his family in the visiting room, except for his youngest brother Richard, who was only 15 years old at the time and could not attend the trial or even meet James. James told his family very firmly that he was innocent. James's brother Michael Hannity collected a petition with about 90,000 signatures claiming that James was innocent after his brother was sentenced to death. But the appeal was rejected and James Hannity's death sentence was confirmed. On April 4, 1962, at 8 o'clock in the morning, 25-year-old James Hannity was executed at Bedford Prison. He was one of the last eight people executed in Britain before the abolition of the death penalty. It is said that the decision to abolish the death penalty in 1965 was also influenced by the attention of this case. And another main suspect Peter Alpin, who had been hinting that he was the killer of a six murder case after Hannity was executed, he participated in a conspiracy to destroy Valerie and Michael's relationship. James was just a scapegoat. The authorities considered Alpin to be a mentally disturbed and nonsensical public figure. At that time, this case caused a huge sensation. Many politicians, pop stars, legal experts and writers believed that James was wrong. Among James's supporters were John Lennon, a very famous founder of the Beatles, and his wife Yoko Ono. Yoko Ono also met with James's parents during her campaign. They accused Valerie of sending an innocent person into the grave. The public's voice caused great trouble to Valerie. In addition, a civil organization called a Six Guardian Committee was spontaneously organized by self-proclaimed activists 
and activist groups, including journalist Paul Ford, activist Finner Brockway and Joan Lester. The latter two were former and current MPs of Eaton constituency where Valerie Story lived. The committee also tried to clear James Hannity's name. They believed that Alphen was the culprit and listed a statement list. Alphen looked more like the portrait than James. Alphen also had a London accent when under pressure. Alphen never provided a satisfactory alibi. Alphen had a more satisfactory motive than James. He was a bad driver. He matched the characteristics of the killer better than James. In addition, Paul Ford obtained a copy of Alphen's bank account. The account showed that Alphen received a total of £7,569 in payments from October 1961 to June 1962. The committee also found that Valerie's original statement was not mentioned during the trial and appeal. Valerie initially said, that the killer was in his 30s, but changed it to 20s in his second statement. It is worth noting that James was 25 years old and Alphen was 31 years old. In 1968, the committee also found six important witnesses who proved that the defendant had indeed been to Rill, a seaside town in North Wales. In addition, after investigating, the committee also found nearly 3,000 undisclosed information, including eyewitness testimonies, search records of crime vehicles, etc. James's mother and brother provided DNA samples to the court to clear their relatives' names by comparing them with evidence from this case. On March 19, 1997, the Home Office transferred the case to the newly established Criminal Cases Review Commission. Although some original items of evidence had been damaged, Valerie's underwear and handkerchief wrapped around the pistol were still intact. The DNA technology at that time when this case occurred was not mature yet, but it has come to 1999 when DNA testing technology has been widely used in criminal investigation. In June 1999, forensic scientists compared DNA samples provided by James's brother and mother with samples from this case. Soon DNA test results were announced. The probability that DNA belongs to James is 2.5 million times higher than other people. The judge of the appellate court stated that the outcome proves James' guilt beyond doubt. Despite this, many people still question the quality of the DNA. Their reasoning is that the sample was stored for too long and could have been contaminated. This argument seems to have some merit, but even if the evidence was contaminated, shouldn't it be even more difficult to match? In December 2010, the defense announced that they would launch a third appeal, mainly targeting death about DNA testing. Although the court could not order the exhumation of James's body, Lord Chief Justice Harry Wolfe decided that it was acceptable, if necessary, for justice. He ordered the exhumation and extracted DNA from James's teeth. The result was the same as before. James Hannity was the culprit. This result finally ended the 40-year-long dispute and proved Valerie's innocence. She had kept silent all by herself, despite being ridiculed by the media. Valerie still tried to live her life. She also drafted a book to tell her story and wrote hundreds of notes for it. Unfortunately, Valerie died in 2016 in the house where she was born. After her death, writer Paul Stickler received these notes and edited them into a book. The title of the book is The Long Silence.